Hello and welcome to Experience Weekly Data Talk, a show featuring data science leaders from around the world. Today, friends, is a very unique topic, something we've never covered before. Uh, we're talking about how scientists are using machine learning to find planets. This is super fascinating, and we're super excited to talk with Victor Pancradius, uh, who is the principal research scientist at MIT's Haystack Observatory. And also, I want to give a shout out to MIT's Department of Earth, Atmospheric, and Planetary Sciences for helping set up today's chat in the Earth Research Lab at MIT. Victor, thank you so much for being our guest today. Well, thank you so much for having me. So, um, I, um, do you want to give a shout out to the team who helped set up today's event? Yes. Uh, well, uh, thanks very much to Josh Kastoff here at the uh, Earth Resource Laboratory. Uh, at MIT. Uh, I'm very happy um, to be hosted here. And uh, it's very interesting to um, uh, reach out and actually learn new things. So maybe, you know, the next podcast will be about machine learning for finding natural hazards. Oh, very cool. I love that. That will be another great topic. So can you kind of, you know, we have a, an amazing group of data scientists in our community on Facebook, and they're always curious about you know, what led you to become a data scientist, to start working in the sciences? Can you kind of share your path with them? Uh, sure, absolutely. So um, I'm a computer scientist by training, and uh, I have a background in parallel computing um, and software engineering. And I came to data science based on the big data challenges that I saw. So I started to talk to different scientists, and they said, well, we have all this big data coming up. And of course, everybody asks, like, how big is this data? <laughs> and we're starting to move towards petabytes per second of data, for example, in radio astronomy with the square kilometer array. Uh, that's um, going to happen over the next uh, decade. And I'm like, wow, this is really fascinating. And then, of course, um, you start asking these questions, like, how are we going to process this data? How are we going to generate deeper insight? So I realized early on that there's a need for computer aided discovery, and that's not just in one field, it's actually across the sciences. And while we're at it, then of course, it's relevant also for business applications and industry applications because they're facing uh, also highly increased data rates these days. So then I thought, well, this is a very fascinating topic where um, we can develop new algorithms, new directions, uh, and actually work with real data. So this is not artificial data, this is real data. And while we're making progress in computer science, we can also make new discoveries. So this interaction I found highly fascinating. That's awesome. So tell me about the data, because you, you mentioned petabytes per second. So much data is coming in that you're collecting. Uh, and using, can you talk a little bit about like what this data looks like? Um, sure. So the, the the petabytes per second, just to um, um, make it clear, this is going to happen over the next decade. Okay. But of course, if you add everything together that we would get from sensor networks, satellite imageries, and so on, maybe you could look at that if you're looking at, at it from a data fusion perspective. Um, but um, realize we're collecting very different types of data, so. Uh, you have images on the one hand that come from satellites, telescopes, and so on. But we also have <clears throat> sensor networks that collect time series of information, uh, be it on Earth or be it, you know, making observations uh, um, looking into space. So um, th this is yet another challenge for, for data scientists, how to cope with these different types of data. And then once you get these images, say, suppose uh, you're looking into the universe, looking at the sky, then you have billions and billions of potential candidates for uh, interesting phenomena. So that's only the starting point for the actual science. Wow. So this data that you're using, you just mentioned sensor data. You're getting so much different types of data that's coming in. What's like the process for even like beginning to label the data? Yeah, so there are actually very different types of approaches we have to consider in this context. <coughs> Excuse me. So one, one is, of course, um, if you're looking at AI and classical machine learning, and particularly 
uh, um, supervised learning, then of course you would think about how do we label this data. Um, but as you can imagine, that's a challenge. So we have to think about alternative ways. Uh, one thing that we leveraged, um, you know, as a starting point as a specific study is to actually leverage crowdsourced data um, for machine learning. Um, and this is uh, a recent publication we just got on, on the exoplanets topic and the debris disk uh, topic uh, because, um, you know, how do you train these machine learning algorithms? Well, if you have no data, then um, NASA had a project called uh, the Disk Detective where they actually involved humans in uh, labeling images. Um, and they, they were shown images with specific properties where you would uh, know that if you have say, um, candidates for planets or debris disks, then um, these images would have to have certain features which you can visually identify. And then people will ask to answer specific questions on categories of what they would see on certain images. Uh, and that constituted like an early um, approach into trying to find different kinds of things. In this case, it was related to planet search. And we were looking at this and said, well, this is very interesting because now we can use this as labeled data to train machine learning algorithms and scale beyond what crowdsourcing can do. Were, so the crowdsourcing part, were there any challenges with getting that set up? Because sometimes people make mistakes. Um, and how did you kind of handle that? So um, this is actually an approach where um, we leveraged uh, what NASA's teams had already done. So NASA had uh, the Disk Detective project led by uh, Mark Kirchner, uh, and they set up basically this whole experiment, you know, carefully thinking about, you know, what kind of categories, categories do we want? What kind of data do we want to look at? Uh, you know, do we want to look in infrared or optical or what wavelengths do we actually need to see the things we're looking for? And uh, they set this experiment up and then of course, um, it is not a perfect um, um, thing when you have humans involved. So you can have false positives or false negatives, uh, or you can, you know, have things where something goes wrong. But uh, you can have other people in this crowdsourcing process check on other people's results. You can get some kind of validation without, you know, having to manually reprocess everything yourself. Um, but yes, uh, it has. Um, pros and cons to do it this way, but uh, this is where we are right now in terms of you know what's been tried out for for this direction. So can you talk a little bit about uh, how you are training artificial intelligence to distinguish planets from the other astronomical objects out there? Sure. So if you're thinking of this problem in a in a general sense, it's a classification problem. So mm -hmm. I give you an image. And there are sets of pixels in this image, and you need to distinguish that a certain set of pixel or an object is a planet, yes or no. So it's a binary classification. And uh, we've tried out different techniques, um, uh, techniques that would require label training sets. And that's how we leverage the uh, crowdsourcing part from the NASA project. Uh, and the other thing we did is uh, there's different techniques on how you um, can find planets. So if you're thinking about this very generally, um, you know, how would you see a planet with your eye if you were able to? You would look at a star and uh, suppose there's only one planet orbiting the star, um, then there's uh, a method called the transit method that looks at the brightness of the star over time. Mm -hmm. And if there's a planet in between you and the line of sight uh, to the star, you would see a slight dip over time. So you get mm -hmm. time series that, you know, essentially look like this, ideally. But as you can imagine, in the real world, there's a lot of noise. Um, there's various things that look like this pattern that are not stars, uh, that are not planets. The stars can have properties that have that kind of pulsation, uh, like variable stars. So it's very difficult to distinguish. Um, so the other ways to do this is then you can use indirect methods. Um, and one particular one that uh, we were exploring in a, in a paper recently published in Astronomy uh, in Computing with our uh, students uh, and co-authored by uh, Professor Seeger. She's uh, in exoplanet research. Um, 
we were looking at debris disks, and these debris disks are essentially um, indicators for planet formation, just because if you're looking at the process, how planets are formed, they typically form where there's debris disks, you know, that, that's the hypo hypothesis. And there have been recent discoveries uh, of exoplanets that have debris disks. So then you could say, well, let's look for debris disks because they're bigger. Uh, and they also show up in uh, survey data that we already have. For example, in the infrared survey um, for the Y satellite, um, which is run by NASA JPL. So this is how you can approach this problem, looking at different things uh, in different data sets, and then trying to find indications, um, you know, what could lead you to understand this classifier on how something can be a planet or not. Um, so what we did is we went out to the Y survey and uh, we, we trained it, use it using the crowdsourced labeled data from NASA. Uh, and then uh, we found candidates for debris disks. We validated that based on the NASA exoplanet archive that contains a list of all the known exoplanets so far. So that's how you can tell, you know, how good are you if you're trying out a new method. Um, and it seemed to work pretty well. So now we have this technique that allows you to say, well, um, I find candidates for debris disks, and then potentially that is an indicator where you can look for more planets. So, you know, this is a piece in this chain mm -hmm. of missions that we have running right now, uh, missions um, that are planned for the future, because it helps you determine, like, where do you want to look? And then with follow-up missions, you can take a closer look at all these debris disks and actually try to see if there's real exoplanets or not. So this is, this is an endeavor that is going to take uh, a longer time, and we're doing piece by piece these little techniques that can help um, us get there. So through this process, how many, I don't even know if this is the right question to ask, but like as you were looking for a debris disk to help with this process of finding planets, like how many potential planets do you think you have found with the data that you've collect, used? Um, well, th that is hard to say because right now we have to validate with the sets and the, the planets uh, that we know. <coughs> I can refer you to our um, uh, paper uh, in astronomy and computing that, that contains uh, this data. And um, you have to look at this, you know, in a, in a very specific way, because also the, the training set that we used was pre-selected. Okay, so you have a, um, potentially, if you were to apply this to the entire universe, there might be a bias just through this pre-selection mm -hmm. uh, and the small number of, uh, uh, of stars. So for example, I can, I can outline some of the numbers that we had simply just because that's the data we had. So it's uh, 114 stars uh, with locations in the southern hemisphere. Uh, and uh, those were determined to be good debris disk candidates by disk detective uh, users. And then we had like 13 from the literature that uh, other uh, researchers deemed to be uh, promising candidates. So it's a total of uh, 127. And then we had like an example of 138 bad candidates. So these are the the kind of numbers uh, we're, we're talking about. Um, and then in the validation, uh, we had the NASA Planet Archive with uh, over 2,000 uh, known planet host stars. Um, so th this is how we validated it. And uh, so far, uh, we got a total accuracy score of um, 0.97 on these specific data sets. But, um, you know, I want to caution you a little bit about these numbers because, you know, they're highly selective and uh, the techniques that, that we develop now can be used to generate a list of candidates for future missions, which have a little bit of, you know, more information based on the training set that we know on what we believe could be the real candidates. So we're actually generating a list of targets, like where to look for with mm. future telescopes. Um, and this is because, you know, you, you need more information to give you a more precise answer. And right now, 
just the sample size that we have are not very big. But that's going to change. But it sounds like you have an awesome start because you're c collecting and finding places where planets may be, um, and it's really cool. Um, this is like a this is like kind of a first big step in that process. Now, uh, one of the things that makes you know the headlines all the time is habitable planets, mm -hmm. and um, I think I saw a while ago like there was some uh, uh, Earth. Earth, they said, is like another Earth, like many, many light years out there. Um, can you? I know that you're. This is not part of your research, but you can you get to talk about th those people who are actually trying to find habitable life on other planets? Um, sure. So I can outline you my perspective as a computer scientist. You know, how can you approach this uh, and and potentially automate these things? This is how computer scientists think. Um, so. Um, typically, what you're looking for is um, what makes a planet habitable, and that's typically several criteria. So far, the community has converged into looking at so-called habitable zones, which means the planet is not too far away and not too close to a certain star. The temperature is okay. You know, everything that could be um, useful for life as we know it on Earth is kind of within the known parameters. Um, and then this criteria they have to apply to the star as well. If you have stellar flares, that would be the corresponding, um, you know, solar flares. But on a star, you know, if they're this big that it, that they could wipe out life in a nearby planet, uh, that's another criterion you want to factor in. Mm -hmm. So that's why you need all these observations, not only about planets but also about stars and understanding how they develop over time. So that's why this, from a data science perspective, it's not, it's not just a snapshot you're looking at. You have to look at all these things over time. Um, so yeah, the key question is, um, are you in the habitable zone or not? Mm. And that's difficult to answer because there's so many parameters. And for most of the planets um, that have been discovered so far, we don't know all the parameters, mm. uh, you know, we know maybe uh, the mass, or we know the orbital parameters, and then we can infer potentially what can be or, there or not. But there's so many more things where we need better observations in order to give a more clear answer. Now, I want to comment a little bit on how I believe um, computationally we can come closer to an understanding uh, maybe life elsewhere. And this is a bit speculative. So, um, you know, bear with me for a moment. It's yes. more like, uh, <laughs> I love this. This is great. So, um, you know, if, if the, the question, even how do you find life on earth is very difficult. And the, the, there has been sort of an experiment back in the Voyager days where, you know, you fly out with Voyager, you're turning around looking at earth and you ask the question, uh, suppose we don't know if there's life or not. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us if there's life on Earth? <laughs> <laughs> so just by what you measure, and that's very difficult. And then you can start thinking about, you know, what would I measure? I, I know to so know something about the atmosphere and the composition and what's in there. And then essentially what you end up doing is a computational model. And this is how I'm looking at this. So. Um, you can look at metabolic processes and biomarkers and molecules that uh, are related to life or used by life or produced by life. So you can look at this as a big graph theoretical problem. Okay, So you have uh, processes that can be described as potentially a very big complex graph, which is maybe incomplete in the way we have it right now. And now you can try and do this in a similar fashion for other planets because you can look at their atmosphere uh, with uh, spectroscopy. So you can look at the light and potentially infer what kind of molecules are there. And then you would try to construct a metabolic graph for potential planets. And then you could look at structural similarities with graph metrics. Is something that's out there similar to what we have on Earth or not? Um, and that's a bit speculative because, uh, you know, there's so many assumptions, one of which is we're looking for life as we know it. Mm. And life as we know it has maybe big parts of this graph centered around carbon. But potentially, this graph could be centered around other elements in the periodic table. Mm. Um, 
But computationally, this is something that we could explore. Uh, you know, what if we had other scenarios? Uh, what would be those metrics? Uh, what would they look like? And uh, potentially, you can run simulations. And um, controversially, I would say, um, maybe the search for life is a computational problem. Mm -hmm. okay. And then you would validate it uh, with the empirical observations. But whatever we do, the empirical observations are not enough. We need to link them to models in order to gain deeper understanding. And this is, I think, a piece of the puzzle um, that I personally find very interesting to think about. Yeah, I mean, it's super exciting. I mean, the research you're doing is like a huge step into that. And so it's so cool to see the work that you're doing around that. Can you talk a little bit about the, the coding languages that you're using uh, with these different uh, models? Sure. So um, we mostly use Python. Um, we also use um, C and C++ um, when it's important to have good performance. But I can generally tell you that the science community now seems to switch to Python. So Python becomes a lingua franca. Um, Python and Jupyter Notebooks for interfaces. Um, and we've adopted this uh, um, language and frameworks in Python just because um, our customers or users are using it. Uh, and aside from that, I think Python is a very beautiful language. Um, um, there are criticisms in terms of performance, but uh, there's ways around that. So uh, um, that's where we would use wrappers around highly performance C and C++ kernels that are good for clustering or, or other methods um, that are uh, required for data science, for the kind of data science that we do. Um, on the other hand, there's also advances in uh, just-in-time compilation for Python. Uh, where you can add essentially decorators or annotations, and then a just-in-time compiler takes your function and compiles it to assembler, uh, redirects your control flow to this particular piece, and then it goes back to your Python. Uh, and then there's other approaches, but these are some of the main techniques we've been using uh, successfully. Um, and to scale on a large scale, we're using uh, web services uh, in the cloud. Um, uh, and uh, this is where we created our own frameworks to be able to offload data processing pipelines um, transparently. And that involved uh, developing our own container technology. So we can essentially put AI or other things into these containers, and then the framework knows how to replicate them in the cloud. So the scientist doesn't have to care where a certain pipeline stage is being processed, uh, how data is being partitioned on a certain node, and so on. I want to ask also about your the team. And when you're looking to bring on new data scientists, what sort of skill sets are really important to you? What personality types are important to you? When I look at the data labs uh, that we, were, we have here at Experian, um, we have data scientists with all different types of backgrounds, physics, stat, st statistics, um, computer science, et cetera. I'm kind of curious about, you know, if working in the space that you are, very specific, finding planets, what sort of skill sets are really important? Because um, I know that we get, we get this question a lot in our community on Facebook. People trying to get a job or trying to enter a certain field, they're wondering like, okay, what are you looking for when you're hiring a data scientist? So I would say um, data science is interdisciplinary because you need to know something about computer science, AI, and, and you know, the technical skills to solve a problem, but you also need to know a lot about the domain. And if you're looking just at the paper that um, we published on the exoplanet search, <coughs> excuse me, uh, we have co-authors with different kinds of expertise. Um, so we have Tam Guyen, um, she is a physicist, basically. Um, then we have Laura Ackman. She's a computer scientist. We have Professor Seeger, who's a planetary scientist. And then I come in as a computer scientist. And none of this could have happened without the knowledge of this entire team. You need to bring this together. Um, and this is something that maybe um, is not really discussed 
in today's discourse on AI because if you want to apply anything on a problem like this, you need to know a lot about the domain. You need to know what is noise and what isn't. You need to know something about the features that, that constitute the phenomena you're looking for. And typically, these are so highly detailed that you cannot just take something out of the box and apply it and expect that you're, you're getting meaningful results. You will mm -hmm. always get results. But the question is, are they really useful and interpretable for you know, the end user, the scientist who actually wants to use that for making a new discovery? Um, and this is also an approach that I followed in my own team. So um, the, the six postdocs uh, in my team uh, have very different backgrounds um, from PhDs in computer science to astrophysics to geophysics to backgrounds in signal processing. Uh, and this is what uh, created many of the successes that we had. Um, and, and I think for the community, it's important to understand that data science is typically teamwork. It's very hard to do it by yourself. Um, because you need to know all these things. I love that you brought in so many different disciplines um, in surrounding yourself with people who have special knowledge in, in different uh, in different areas. Um, so, you know, you bring you bring these teams together, and you're working on a problem. How much, um, as you're working on something, like do you encourage debate within the team? Um, different people have different ideas on how to approach a problem. Can you kind of explain about like how your team kind of operates on on, on di different issues? Uh, absolutely. So uh, debates are really important. And um, I remember we had situations where even for implementations, like for parallelizing certain algorithms, you know, even drilling down to that, we ended up uh, having several versions of different implementations to evaluate and figure out, you know, which one is best, which one should we go for. Um, we very often have uh, early prototypes where we're trying to evaluate which way to go. Um, but also the domain expertise can cut short in many of these discussions. Mm. Uh, because people would say, uh, oh, this is a great idea, but um, a geoscientist would never do it like this. Or an astrophysicist would never be interested in this kind of result. Uh, or this algorithm works and scales, but this is not the type of thing you really want in the community. Or we want more explainability on how your methods work. And that kind of uh, makes it very difficult for many machine learning applications that have no explainability in their inner workings to be acceptable for physicists. And that's why many physicists are still rejecting um, you know, discoveries made by machine learning because you need to have this explainability. <coughs> so, um, yeah, one technique that we uh, converged on is um, we need to infuse domain knowledge into our algorithms uh, when it comes to computer-aided discovery because then you're able to explain the inner workings uh, much better uh, plus, the algorithms become more efficient because the um, candidates that are being presented to you already vetted with basic physics knowledge, uh, where the candidates that don't make sense in terms of physics already excluded. That's awesome. Um, <clears throat> so, I, I always like to ask a couple questions before we end every Data Talk episode. And the first one is um, there are a lot of unknowns and fears about how AI. Might change society, and you know, there's always those scary headlines that come up about automation, robotics replacing jobs. And I'm kind of curious about your view of the future of AI. Yeah, so I think we are at a junction um, because there are two sides of this coin. Uh, you can do very bad things with AI, but you can also do very good things with AI. And that I think it's it's the interest it's the interesting potential about it. It's like fire, you know. You can use mm -hmm. fire to do something bad, but you can also use it to warm yourself up or cook a meal. Um, and just looking at the potential with AI applied in different areas of our life, 
um, suppose we can increase our GDP, and I, I'll speculatively say a number, suppose we increase it by a million times, a million times the GDP, so our wealth becomes so much more than we've ever had. Uh, we enable totally new applications that were impossible before. Just think of healthcare or other applications where you can be diagnosed much earlier with a, a disease and then get the better treatment and so on. So this can have profound changes in our life. Um, so it transforms essentially society. Um, so what it means is at the same time where we're innovating on AI, we probably also have to innovate on the way we want our society to work mm -hmm. because technology by itself is not the problem. The problem is how do we organize ourselves as a society to benefit from what AI has to offer. Um, and I, I believe that uh, if we make further progress, not only with um, the techniques that we have today that mostly focus on detecting new things, feature detection, neural networks, classification, think about the inference part of AI, uh, being able to create more sophisticated theories from data uh, is something that can help us understand the world and the universe in unprecedented ways. And just think of it as a, as a teaser. Suppose you know nothing about the world, you take all this data. Can you infer the theory of relativity? Or can you infer something that explains the world even better, uh, if it's possible at all? Or can you make a machine win a Nobel Prize just because a machine could generate theories mm. that are so nuanced and so much better potentially than what our cognitive abilities are as humans? Um, so these are all great potentials, and they could help us advance society in unprecedented ways. So I'm looking at this as a chance, but it's contingent on whether we are able, as a world, to organize our society in such a way that um, you know it's it's for the good and it benefits everybody. I love the answer. Well, Victor, thank you so much for your time today. This has been a fascinating discussion. We've never covered it before. And I learned a ton, took a ton of notes while listening to you talk. Um, where can people get in contact with you? Where, they, where, where can they learn more about you? So uh, I have a website, uh, victorpancratis.com. Um, if somebody's interested in learning more about uh, the techniques that we've developed in computer-aided discovery or the type of machine learning we've applied to uh, astronomy or geoscience problems, um, I'm also tweeting at uh, vpancratis. Um, and my current goal is to expand our techniques beyond just the astro and geo domain. So I'm, I'm very interested to talk to biologists, chemists, uh, uh, financial people, um, you know, all domains that could benefit from uh, computer aided discovery and domain aware artificial intelligence. I think uh, this is something that's very interesting to pursue. So uh, uh, if somebody wants to reach out to me, I'm more than welcome to, uh, to chat. Wonderful. Uh, for those listening to the podcast, if you'd like to see the video or get the links to um, the research that Victor has done um, and also links to his website and social profiles, uh, you can go to the Experian blog and the short URL is just ex.pn slash datatalk47. Again, it's ex.pn slash datatalk47. That'll bring you over to the full transcription of today's chat and all the links that Victor mentioned. Uh, there's a whole bunch, um, good articles, and also the research that he's recently done on finding planets with machine learning. So Victor, thank you so much for being our guest. Um, it was awesome having you. I'd love to have you back whenever possible. And also grateful and thankful to MIT for uh, setting this all up, having an awesome camera, great sound. So tr they did a terrific job. Well, th thank you very much. And I also want to thank all my collaborators uh, and students and my hosts here. Uh, MIT has been so great in actually setting a fruitful ground for this kind of research, uh, which, as you can imagine, if you're starting something like this with a cross-disciplinary focus, is um, very difficult to do. Uh, but MIT has provided this fantastic environment so we could make uh, lots of progress. Thank you very Wonderful. much. Wonderful. Thank you, Victor. Take care. Thank you.